so when I was in eighth grade, um, I learned Newton's laws of motion like uh, all other kids, and uh, one of the uh, first principles was that when a car is in motion, it will continue to be in motion till it, time, uh, till it uh, encounters a red signal. Um, it's very important that uh, this works in most parts of the world, and, uh, but unfortunately in this part of the world, I see that it's not necessarily always the case. And so therefore, um, I do celebrate the diversity of uh, thought and practice uh, within the country, but the amount of individuality that we uh, express uh, in today's world is more than what it was in the generation that I was uh, brought up in. We were assembly line um, students, we had assembly line factories, and uh, of course, the, uh, the world was changing and now we have uh, paint companies talking about Meravala cream. We have car companies talking about configuring cars that are customized to one's personality and his uh, liking. And so therefore we are beginning to express ourselves as more and more individualistic and of course it's completely justified because I am therefore unique. The three principles that drive um, this uniqueness um, has a definite effectiveness in all the kind of areas of work that is there and I would probably talk about how and uh, why we are looking at healthcare transformations that uh, probably would be driven by our idiosyncrasies. We are different from our physiology point of view, no-brainer. We are also different from our egoistic reactions and ego uh, perceptions, again a no-brainer. But of course we are also biased and influenced by our relationships and that makes what is me. So then what is the relevance of today's medicine? Today's medicine is based on evidence-based medicine. The problem with evidence-based medicine is that we assume that 80% of the population falls within my um, you know, successful form of treatment and we have outliers. Unfortunately, most of us are outliers. Many of us identify ourselves as outliers in, from this uh, evidence-based medicine. And to illustrate this point, um, the basic concept of evidence-based medicine is based on factors that are related to a population, a randomized clinical trial, and people who respond, and people who didn't respond and had unfortunate consequences. But the fact is that we are now beginning to look at why are we looking at this, this form of uh, healthcare. Just to give you an example, I'll take you to three uh, personal incidences that I've been closely related to with. One of the instances was a 30-year-old female who came with advanced breast cancer to a hospital, a well-known hospital in Bangalore, was advised radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and some draconian um, surgical procedures. Um, but at the end of the day, the family decided that we are not going to take this treatment. We will go back and allow nature to take its own course. Fortunately, it was a happy ending. The woman presented herself in the clinic uh, three months later and the tumor just disappeared. Strangely enough, this happens a lot of times and uh, many of us don't have the uh, kind of courage to be able to say, I'm not taking the treatment and the consequences can be otherwise. But then the fact is that we have instances where a 42-year-old man with advanced AMI, which is three arteries blocked, coming into the hospital and saying that I'm not going to get stented for this particular uh, reason. It doesn't, uh, you know, sort of uh, agree with me. But then, you know, the heart builds collaterals very quickly, and so therefore he's still alive. And then, of course, this uh, other incident of a 40-year-old female whose father was suffering from chronic heart failure was in the hospital, uh, presented in the emergency room, 
with acute myocardial infarction and, well, the ECG didn't show anything, troponin T didn't show anything, and so therefore they kept him on that stretcher for quite some time, uh, which unfortunately wasn't a very uh, pleasant ending, and it was more tragic. But the fact is that nobody could make a decision based on uh, the diagnostic finding of the equipment. Maybe the equipment wasn't functioning well, maybe the uh, doctor was not so trained enough to be able to see the signals, but it was an unfortunate incident. Taking us to the fact that the outliers were a part of the evidence-based medicine, or they were outliers in the evidence-based medicine system, but at the same time, they hold clues to what could be possibly the cures for certain diseases which we have been struggling with. Um, very important part of uh, my discussions and my practice there is that I've seen uh, a lot of uh, cases which come into the ICU and standard protocols don't work. So it's gut feel that really takes an individual to a successful outcome with the intensive care or the emergency room. My name is Vijay Simha, I'm a life scientist and uh, I practice life engineering as, uh, uh, as a profession. And so therefore, um, I've been involved in all this activity and this, this whole healthcare business and have been thinking about uh, what works and what doesn't work. And um, over a period of time, I've begun to apply some of my um, physical science knowledge into um, healthcare and um, Oops. Using this Kinefin tool, um, I've been trying to understand how the practice has been going. If you look at it here, um, we have from the very simple, we have from the very simple best practices, um, which are very linear kind of uh, phenomenon, which happen where if this happens, then do this, and generally you have a very predictable, predictable outcome to the little bit more complicated where we can have, say, multiple outcomes from a particular action that you take, to things which move towards complex and chaotic where you just don't know what's going to happen if you do this. Fortunately, um, a good part of uh, many of the stuff which evidence-based medicine works on falls within the best practices and the complicated range which can be um, comprehended by the human mind. But when we go to complex and we go to chaotic uh, systems, our mind is not capable of being able to deliver that kind of computing power to comprehend, say, six parameters, seven parameters systems. And so therefore, um, we need to depend on computers, we need to depend upon processing power and we need to depend upon a completely new generation of the ability to sense our biophysical signals. And that's the reason why um, a new area of medicine which is emerging across the world, which is based on the fact that it is more systems oriented than just purely um, you know, X leads to Y kind of a situation, is emerging and it's called functional medicine and there are groups of people practicing this across the world. But that's sub not something new to us. In fact, we have been exposed to systems medicines for 5,000 years. And this is, um, you must be familiar with Ayurveda and most of the uh, holistic medicine, assumes that the body is a complete system and it doesn't work on the basis of small linear transactions that happen between molecules in the body. So, very um, similar to what we are used to in Ayurveda with the three doshas and stuff of that sort, everything happens in, in, with three polar uh, points where um, the wellness kind of is balanced. So just to explain where I'm coming from is that basically uh, we move to a new paradigm of thinking where we are saying that um, the current evidence-based medicine is based on facts that we continue to read two-dimensional information for whatever 
um, we try to depend on and we try to predict things with two-dimensional information. CT scans, pap smears, they are all two-dimensional images. Now what happens is that at some point or the other, we are saying that these snapshot images are not going to give us the concept of a dynamic healthcare, uh, health uh, and a wellness situation. So we are trying to say that we need to move from a paradigm of taking snapshots and static images to a kind of interactive video game mode of um, managing our wellness. And obviously, I mean, the only stakeholder that is interested in doing this is yourself, your own health, right? So therefore, we need to empower individuals with the ability to be able to monitor their own health. And here is what I'm trying to explain is in the area of physics, where we try to uh, look at fractals and devise pathways in uh, chaos systems where we can continuously monitor and steer our way through the wellness tunnel. An example where um, a therapeutic procedure is used electrically to be able to decide which pathway the disease is going to take or the wellness is going to take before it can come to a favorable outcome. So this is, this is something that is going to drive probably the main ingredients for AI of tomorrow. Um, AI is something that's going to replace um, a lot of the current practices through its ability to be able to do extensive calculations in the nonlinear uh, region and uh, not really to replace people from their jobs. Um, as an example, these are some of the tools that we have uh, uh, I have put together as indicators which are moving towards uh, the ability to monitor very complex biophysical signals as they come out of the body. So in short, in summary, I would say that these are the four drivers that are being driven on the basis of um, me as an individual wanting to have uh, these, um, these parameters in and uh, the, the health-seeking behavior is one of them. We are becoming more and more conscious that we need to uh, be able to, you know, sort of seek um, good health as, as a priority apart from food and money. Um, there are a large number of new sensors coming in which expand the horizons of our ability to be able to see and hear things better. And then, of course, uh, we have a lot of uh, AI-based systems that um, um, uh, will assist the physician or the people who are going to guide you into wellness or the individual himself to be able to achieve that uh, goal of uh, remaining well. And most importantly, there is a move that we can actually achieve towards what we call as personalized medicine. So which I'm saying is, what I'm saying here is that basically evidence-based medicine and personalized medicine are kind of non-compatible uh, in their, I mean, they're, um, non, they're disjointed amongst themselves. They are orthogonal. So, um, there are many questions and one of the biggest challenges in medical science is the word idiopathic and uh, obviously I mean we don't have answers to everything in, uh, in the world but um, the word idiopathic happens very very frequently uh, to many of us and uh, one of the major challenges that we've been trying to, uh, I've been asking many questions to people uh, as an engineer is that our blood system runs about 100,000 kilometers how come with uh, 120 millimeters of mercury, we are able to pump this blood through the body? Everyone tells me that blood flows through the capillaries and through the various veins and arteries as a Newtonian fluid or, you know. But is it possible? There is a little calculation here, which says that I need 10 to four, uh, power of 14 bars to actually take even water through this, uh, this length of uh, tubing. But we have only 120 millimeters of mercury. I'm happy to uh, receive your thoughts and ideas about this, but it could be another subject for 
somebody to talk about it. Uh, I have a friend called Jay Harmon, uh, who probably has the answer, but uh, he hasn't told me yes or no. Thank you very much. Yeah.